Okay, so thank you so much for um, coming and changing rooms. So I'll try and um, be as quick as possible so we can get to the other really exciting speakers as well. So um, if you can't tell from my accent already um, and how fast I speak, I'm from Australia um, and I'll be talking about um, a paper that we recently published called The Misnomer of High Functioning Autism. Um, so actually this is a paper that we recently published a couple of months ago in the journal Autism. So if you're interested in the research, you can go and um, find it online. Um, for those of you who would like a more accessible version, we do have some lay summaries, video abstracts, um, and a tweet summary just so that there's a bit more um, an accessible version of the paper available. Um, and the motivation for this research really came from um, other people's research about what autistic people prefer in terms of terminology and language. So um, this really great paper um, surveyed people from the UK autism community and found that there were a range of different um, perspectives in, in preferred language and terminology. Um, but unsurprisingly, when we looked at um, uh, the language of high functioning and low functioning descriptors, actually autistic people actually um, report that these are misleading descriptors um, and are not preferred um, use of language. Um, and this is because, um, if I can read out some of these ones, that are there, the text is a bit small. Um, for example, high and low functioning implies a value judgment with unpleasant implications, or that the term high functioning autism should be scrapped because it minimizes the problems that someone with autism can face in daily living. Um, and one person says, in general, functioning labels should be abandoned in favour of concrete descriptions of an individual's specific access needs for particular accommodations. So in my opinion, it's very hard to disagree with some, um, with some so profound um, uh, language from other people, but um, in our opinion, we really wanted to um, provide some concrete data to support um, the perspectives of our autistic community. So. Um, when we actually look and see um, how much people actually use high functioning autism in our everyday language, um, we actually see that it's been used um, pretty consistently since about the 1980s. Um, so this is a graph that, dis um, that displays the rate of the use of the phrase high functioning autism relative to other sorts of descriptors um, in the medical literature, so in a, a database called PubMed, which is where we um, index medical research. Um, and you can see that even though um, the DSM was introduced in 2013, we actually still see a, an in, uh, a steady increase over time um, of the use of the word high-functioning autism within um, titles and abstracts. Um, now, even though this, we do have appropriate other language that we can use, um, we still see that people are pretty... Um, pretty consistently will use this language basically to describe an individual who doesn't have a cognitive impairment. So um, it was originally introduced in the 80s to basically to distinguish individuals who um, didn't have a cognitive disability or a cognitive impairment, so IQs above 70, or in earlier literature it was 80 or 85. And the researchers themselves said that this was an arbitrary cutoff. It wasn't um, meant to be used in clinical language. However, we do still use it very, very much in clinical language. We use, many people use the language in lay descriptions of autism, and we're very um, poor in research in, in changing our language. And we know very much from the autistic community that this language carries very strong implications and assumptions about someone's functional levels, even though it's actually based on someone's estimated cognitive ability. And often what we're referring to when we talk about someone's functioning levels is we're actually referring to their adaptive behavior, so their um, skills and behaviors that they acquire over time into, in everyday context. So these can be your communication skills, your socialization skills, those practical everyday living skills that you need um, in everyday context. Um, and clinically and in research, we often will assess adaptive behavior using measures such as the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale. So this is one of the most commonly used instruments probably in autism research. And this is simply a questionnaire that assesses those different domains of functioning. Um, and it's probably unsurprising to many researchers that we, we already know that adaptive behavior um, shows differences in people on the spectrum compared to age-matched peers or 
peers with other developmental conditions. But we also see that functioning levels do tend to decline with age. Um, and we also know very much so that IQ and adaptive scores do tend to correlate well with each other. However, when we do look at IQ scores and adaptive functioning scores in individuals without an intellectual disability, we see that these correlations are actually a little bit poorer or weaker than what we would expect. Um, and we also know that funding decisions or um, decisions about how much uh, access to services or educational provisions can actually be influenced by an IQ estimate or an assumption of someone's functioning level. So it's actually really important that we um, have some evidence that says that an IQ estimate is actually a good uh, predictor or a proxy for someone's functioning level. So the aim of our study was to identify whether there was an association between adaptive functioning and IQ scores in individuals diagnosed with autism in Western Australia. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, where we are in Australia, we're the westernmost part of Australia, so we're a third of the country, about the size of about half of Europe in just our state. Um, and we took data from a registry called the Western Australian Autism Registry. This is something that has existed in our state since 1999, and for a long period of time, up until very recently, it actually contained data from every single individual diagnosed with autism in our state. So up until last year, we have about 6,000 records on there with pretty detailed information about someone's diagnosis, their IQ or estimated IQ and their adaptive functioning scores, along with a range of other demographics. Um, and this is something that we are continuing to still collect data on. So for our study, we specifically looked at children diagnosed at the age, under the age of 18, where we did have some estimate of their IQ as well as those fine line adaptive behaviour scores. And importantly, what we wanted to do was calculate a different score. So not just look at IQ or fine line scores in separately, but look at them um, relative to each other. And this is because they are both what we call standard scores. So they have um, a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So if we, if we think that IQ is a good estimate of someone's functioning levels, these scores should sort of be around the same. Um, just to tell you a little bit about our sample, so we actually had over 2,200 people included in this study. So for this reason, we think that this is one of the largest studies in this area and a very representative sample um, across the wide range of functioning and ability levels. Um, we actually had about 50% of our sample in, um, in either group. That was just a group categorised by whether or not they did or didn't have an intellectual disability um, or they had IQ scores above or below that, um, that threshold of 70. Um, and as you would expect, these groups were different on a few characteristics, not on, on sex, but on age of diagnosis. So kids who were diagnosed with an intellectual disability um, or a global de developmental delay were often diagnosed a lot younger. So our main takeaway message from this um, study uh, was that while we would expect that our Vineland scores were lower in children who did have an intellectual disability and a diagnosis of autism, there was a significant difference um, in those IQ and, and Vineland scores for children who didn't have an intellectual disability. So these are children who would have been called high-functioning autism. And actually what we do see is that these, um, these bars here indicate um, a different score at more than 15 or below. So 15 is one standard deviation or a clinically significant difference. And we see this very large decrease in functioning levels relative to IQ scores across all age groups. Um, and this is just to demonstrate that this is consistent across all, um, all scales, so communication scales, daily living scales, and it was actually much stronger for socialization. So if we look at just broadly everyone's scores plotted on the one graph, you can see that there is a very significant decline in uh, Vineland composite scores relative to IQ scores in our kids who don't have um, an intellectual disability. So the majority of these kids are really falling at more than one standard deviation below, um, below their IQ scores. So this is a really significant clinical difference. So our main takeaway message from this study is really that we very strongly believe that fi high functioning autism is an inaccurate term to describe the functioning of individuals on the autism spectrum when it is based on um, IQ estimates alone. Um, and this is something that 
is not new to most people, I would think, um, in the autistic community, but it is something that we as researchers have been very slow to change our language on for some time now. And this provides concrete quantitative evidence to demonstrate why we should be changing our language and not using um, the term high functioning autism. We also believe that if we continue to use this term, we can continue to perpetuate these sort of cycles of disadvantage. Um, so where decisions for educational provision or services are based on this expectation of greater functional abilities, we are potentially denying access to services and supports that kids who don't have these intellectual challenges may need. Um, and it also reinforces us to continue to use these sort of binary high and low language terms that we know that people in the autistic community don't prefer us to use. We also advocate that we think that strengths-based functional assessment should be absolutely a part of the diagnostic process, and it, and it isn't for most countries in the world. Um, and it's something that we're very strongly advocating for in our research group. Um, and our, this data really does strongly support that we should abandon the use of our term high functioning from our research and our language. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the um, wonderful group of authors who contributed to this study and our funders. Um, and if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to me online. Um, uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Dr. Alvarez, for this very interesting and clear talk. So we have time now for two, one or two questions. It's difficult to see the audience with the lights. So please, if you have questions, can you move to the microphone, which is the closest to you? There is one here. I see someone here. Does it have the microphone, please? Doesn't work. Okay, we have another microphone here. If you come up, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Oh, please, someone give the microphone. So the question was, was there a difference between different versions of the Vineland? So uh, no, so we had data from the Vineland, the original Vineland and the second Vineland. Um, no, that wasn't the question. The subtest of the domain scores. So there wasn't any difference between the communication subscale, the daily livings, uh, um, the socialization. Um, the effects were very consistent across all of the domains, yeah. Thank you. Is there another question? Yeah, please. I will have the same problem with the microphone. There is another one here. Yeah, no microphone. <laughs> okay. Is someone fighting for the microphone for the next talk, please? Is there someone from the technical staff, please, to check for the microphone? Um, so the question was whether we accounted for variability in the different scales because of differences in things like dyslexia and dyspraxia and, and other types of comorbidities. Um, no, we, did, we had limited information about that sort of um, comorbidities. We do have a few um, things like ADHD and other conditions recorded, but it, um, because those things weren't assessed at the time of diagnosis, it was just a diagnosis for autism, we, don't ha we have limited control over this. But the sheer scale of the study means that some of that um, noise with comorbidities hopefully is accounted for. Thank you. <laughs> 